Good afternoon. I am Kim Melnick, School Board Chair, in the administrative, informal, and workshop session of this meeting of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, is hereby convened at 3.30 on this 12th day of March, 2024. At this time, I will ask Madam Clerk to please tally the roll call. Ms. Anderson, are you on? There you go. Okay. So, Madam Chair, present in the school board chamber is Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Vice Chair Franklin, Ms. Manning, Chair Melnick, and Ms. Owens. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please note members of the public will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on schoolboard.vbschools.com forward slash meetings forward slash live broadcast on VBTV channel 47 and on Zoom. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. This afternoon, we will begin with our school board administrative matters and reports. Do any school board members have anything to report? Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, just wanted to give the update that the policy review committee meeting that was going to be scheduled for this week on Thursday has been rescheduled to the 21st, which is next Thursday at 10 a.m. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And as I see Ms. Riggs coming down the hallway, I know she has something to say. So um, she did tell me about it this morning, so I'll start it if she needs to finish while she's listening to me. Um, the VSBA has... Um, sent um, an email to us all asking us to bring forward anything that we might deem important for um, legislative um, options, um, things that might benefit VSBA. And if it's picked up by VSBA, um, um, we're recognized and they carry, um, carry it forward. So the legislative committee that to date has not scheduled a meeting, um, I think I'm, I guess I'll ask you guys to work on that so that you guys can discuss, you and uh, Ms. Manning and Ms. Riggs can discuss that, um, and I'll let you pick up from there. I did announce okay. a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't get a chance to call you, Mr. Culpepper, and Ms. Manning today because I've been running all day long, and um, I talked talk to Joel Andrews today to find out what would be a good time for us to meet and um, so we're working with uh, your schedule uh, Mr. Culpepper he was saying um, probably around the, the meeting of the 23rd if possible we can meet the hour hour and a half before we have our meeting here that way the governor will have had all of his ducks in a row everything will be ready by then he said it would be a good time to give an update and just, you know, the full, complete um, review. And then and if everybody send in any um, interest or anything of that nature that they would like for us to take forth or take forward for, for us in our, in our um, legislative meeting or committee from Virginia Beach or anything we want to send to the SBA. Anyway, he said he would put that down if you guys if that worked for y'all because i know we wanted to do sooner than later this year so anyway i just I went ahead and called him because then we had the meeting tonight and asked him when would it when would they be ready he has to the governor is supposed to have it ready by april 8th he said so then if something else comes up he said the he said something about the 17th but then he said the 23rd would cover it and we you know so for clarity and then he could also come that night the day of our meeting you know, get it on the agenda and give an update of everything, the whole budget, everything that's going on. So anyway, I want I wanted to call you two today and say, hey, is this is work for you? But so give you that, you know, that date. So for clarification, you mean the 26th, that Tuesday? Yeah. The okay. 26th. And we start that Sorry. day um, at we start that day at two. April the 26th. Oh, you're talking. You're going. No, into I'm, April. I'm talking April. I'm not talking March. I'm talking April. Oh, I beg your pardon. No, April 23rd. Oh, okay. That yeah. seems so. Yeah, far away. Well, that's what he said. He okay. said that he said any sooner would be counterproductive. Okay. Because things can change. All right, Miss Manning. Um, yeah, could someone send me the legislative 
the email that you're talking about from the VSBA because I don't recall that I received it. So if someone could send that to me, I'd appreciate it. I'll forward it. that to you. Thank okay. you. And I think perhaps it could, I'll defer to Mr. Culpepper since he is the only board member right. kind of on the committee left from the previous committee on when he would like to meet. But I think it would be helpful if we could meet before that because from what I understand, the timeline for the VSBA to get that information to them regarding legislation No, we don't need to have it. We don't have to have it to them. The deadline is June, like June 16th or something like okay. that. I'll send it to you. Okay. So Great. that's why I, when I read that this morning, okay. or actually last night, I think I, came, I got it last night or this morning, that's when I called Joel to find out the timeline for the budget and the General Assembly and all of that. Okay. So that's why we got discussing it, and I did not have time to call you or Mr. Culpepper all day today because I've been running crazy. Okay, yeah, Mr. Culpepper, if you so. could just let us know what date and time is, is good for you if you can't make that date. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, just as a point of clarification, in April, due to the spring break, our meetings are going to be on April 16th and April 30th. It's the third and fifth Tuesday of that month. Okay, so then. That's up to you guys. Well, I, I'll just, I'll, we'll talk. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Next up is our final budget CIP workshop. Welcome, Ms. Pate, Chief Financial Officer. So good afternoon, Chairwoman Melnick, Vice Chairwoman Franklin, School Board members, Dr. Robertson. This presentation is to update you on the most recent recommendations to the fiscal year 2024-25 operating budget and six-year CIP program. We are scheduled to bring to the school board in our formal meeting later this evening two resolutions for school board approval, one on the fiscal year 2024-25 operating budget and one on the six-year CIP program. The agenda for this presentation is shown on this slide. We will cover the revised administrative recommendations for City Council's proposed two cent reduction in the real estate tax rate. The House and Senate reached an agreement Thursday on the budget. I will provide you with any additional information we have received on the state budget. I will then review the proposed final fiscal year 2024-25 operating budget and then turn the presentation over to Mr. Freeman who will review the proposed final 2024-25 through 2029-30 CIP plan. So we've been working to provide the school board's administrators recommendations to balance the budget for the two cent real estate tax cut, um, which results in a let loss in revenue of approximately $5.7 million. The next two slides contain some information we previously shared with you and some new information based on feedback from the board in last Tuesday's workshop. Should the city council not adopt a tax cut, then these items may be reinstated or not implemented as noted. The information on this slide to cover the one cent reduction remains unchanged from the prior presentations. I will let you review this slide for a moment to reacquaint yourselves with administrators' recommendations to cover this loss in funding. The first two lines on this slide re remain um, from the prior presentations, with the exception of the cuts to TEAs, which was reduced from $725,000 to $546,023. Based on feedback from the board, we remove the pay-to-play recommendation. Revised recommendations to balance the additional one-cent cut in real estate tax rate include a cut to unified insights of $198,772. Unified insights is a fully comprehensive analytics platform with actionable insights across all key aspects of school and district operations. The platform allowed school-based staff and district administrators access to a dashboard of data points from attendance to grade performance and graduation rates. VBCPS has other platforms available that can provide this information. We are also recommending additional staff cuts to include four secondary assistant principals, three library media assistants, 
one instructional technology specialist, and one technology support technician for a total of $789,630. And we increased the number of central office positions to be cut from 7.5 to 8.5 for a total of $664,117. Of note, no staff will lose their current job as we will meet these cuts through normal attrition. The additional position we added to be cut from central office will be in the Department of Technology and similar to what I just noted that no staff is losing their job and we will meet these cuts through attrition. <coughs> Moving on to an update on the state budget. The state announced on Thursday that the House and Senate reached an agreement on the budget. We still are awaiting for Virginia Department of Education to release a calculation tool. For education, they provided raises of 3% in each year for teachers and removed the one-time bonus proposed by the governor. They are committed to ensuring that Virginia's teachers' pay will be above other states by the end of the next biennium. In addition, they agreed to backfill the revenue loss from the elimination of the sales tax on food for human consumption and essential personal hygiene products. For Virginia Beach City Public Schools, that could amount to approximately $5.8 million. They also provided funding for other important programs, including at-risk and English language learners. Also included was the expansion of the sales tax base to include digital products and services. Sales tax distributions reduce the state's share of basic aid funding, which in turn will reduce our basic aid funding based on our composite index. So it's not a one-to-one -one reduction. We are also expected to see $500,000 in the first year and $250,000 in the second year to support the establishment of a recovery school for students residing in Region 2. Virginia Beach City Public Schools shall submit a report regarding the planning, implementation, and outcomes of the Recovery High School to the chairs of the House Appropriations Committee and Senate Finance and Appropriations Committee by December 1st each year. They also adjusted the group life insurance rate from 1.34% to 1.18%, which is the actuarial rate approved by the VRS board, and this should be a savings to Virginia Beach City Public Schools of approximately $800,000. So there were other smaller technical adjustments as well. Overall, based, uh, we hope to see an additional 13 to $16 million when we receive the CALC tool from the Department of Education. As previous noted, previously noted, this slide um, shows items to consider with additional funding from the state. We shared in the last meeting we were looking at the need of an additional $11.8 million in order to compensate staff at an average of 3%. If funding is provided over that $11.8 million, we can review the elimination of planned cuts or reductions made to balance the CON, or we could look at the feasibility of implementing one of the options proposed by Siegel that provided higher levels of compensation to staff, or we can consider other ideas presented by the school board. This slide shows our proposed fiscal year 2024-25 operating budget, including the net impact of the two cent cut in the real estate tax rate. There's no difference in that top section of this slide from what you've seen in the past, where we started with what was in the CON with overall revenues of 954.5 million, factoring in the net loss of the two cent reduction of 5.7 million, bringing the overall revenues down to 948.8 million. And so if you recall, the 5.7 million net is a result of 7.2 million is the two cent reduction. There is an est a new estimate for the revenue sharing formula of an increase of 1.5. So that's the net of the, that brings us to the 5.7 million. At the bottom of this slide are the items we use to balance. These are the same items I just previously covered on the earlier slides for one cent and two cent. So you see at the bottom the uh, unified insight cut as well as the staff cuts that I mentioned earlier. I'll give you a moment. I have one more slide and then I'll get, before I turn to Mr. Freeman, you can. That'd be great. So what is next? 
we will be asking again the school board for your approval this evening of the 2024-25 operating budget and six-year CIP plan. On March 26, we are scheduled to present the budget to City Council. State budget has gone to the governor for his consideration and action. The assembly is general is scheduled to reconvene on April 17th to consider the governor's vetoes and proposed amendments to legislation. Again, any additional funding from the state will result in doing an amendment to the approved budget and bringing it back to the school board for approval and then city council. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. I'll be glad to take questions now before I turn it over to Mr. Friedman. You have one, Mr. Callum? I'm just clicking the button. I can't, I can't oh. proceed without clicking the button. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Stop. Okay, here we go. Back to slide number nine in reference to the planning for additional state funding. I just wanted to clarify, I was left with an impression that of the items listed, they are in an either or format as opposed to a both and. Meaning the cuts, I mean, I'm trying to, I guess, no, the oh. raises and the implementation of other compensation from Siegel. Did I hear that correctly? That it's an either or as opposed to a both and? It pretty much is. If we're looking for about 13 to 16 million dollars right now, which is what we think we're going to see back from this additional money from the state, and we need 11.8 million, that's pretty much going to cover that compensation piece. So anything over that that we receive, that's when we're going to probably go to what would the board like to see? Do you want to put that additional? amount towards compensation would you like to see us reinstate some additional cuts so it's kind of like both so okay. some of it's both and then either or I don't know that's you have a future in politics <laughs> no no thank you no thank you too close to retirement for that <laughs> she's too smart for that <laughs> thank you thank you okay Miss Manning I know you, you, she, her computer's restarting, Ms. Yeah. Anderson, Thank so you. just put yourself back in. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take. So. Um, so on the state budget update portion, Ms. Penny, um, the GA provided raises of 3% each year, but the biennium, does that require a local match? It's going to, that 3% is for SOQ and position, so it will require us if we were to pr uh, approve it, uh, raise for everyone, we will have to do it for the non-SOQ positions, yes. Okay. So it doesn't require a match. We just have to fund the non-SOQ position Correct. Ourselves. That's the decision that we make, that everybody would receive the same, the, a raise oh, based okay. on the option. So okay, we, so the 3% is just for SOQ. Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and then just for future knowledge, I think it could be helpful for us to, and I, I, I know it, we don't have to decide until April or May, but that will be upon us soon. Regarding the additional funding, I would like to know um, perhaps Dr. Robertson, um, staff's recommendation, if we were to do the other compensation options by Siegel, if we could get an idea of what staff would recommend we fund next in that study. Okay. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Now, Ms. Anderson. Um, just for clarification purposes, um, with these changes, <clears throat> Does that mean that um, we are not making cuts in some of the arts that we've been discussing about? So we've never come before the board to say we're making actual cuts. We have to go with what Dr. Robertson has mentioned in previous meetings, but that's what is based on enrollment and the allocations that are associated with that. So we're not going through the budget and saying we're cutting this information. It's right, not one but of our we, line of we were cutting allocations allocations but that's based on enrollment okay so not so is that still happening dr robertson yeah so that we used um uh, a budget savings method to meet the Sion by raising the staffing ratio from 21.25 to 1 and 21.75 to 1 which resulted in 71 fewer secondary teachers what we haven't separated out is what would the um decrease in enrollment at the secondary level mean to the reduction of teachers just in general. So I believe we're roughly down 700 students projected. Um, 
next year at the secondary level. So if you divided 71, 700 divided by 21.75, you would have that fewer, that many fewer teachers. And I think that's about 35 teachers that you would be down. We're down okay. 71 with just alone with the staffing ratio. So then the question becomes to the board, should we receive the revenues we're expecting? You guys are going to have some lots of latitude about what you want to do with the little bit of extra money um, in terms of where do you want to put it. And we'll bring all of that back to you and engage you in a conversation um, over probably a couple of meetings so you have a chance to really think about it. Then we can come back to you again a second time and, and see where the board lands on what to do with uh, any of the additional revenues. I'll reserve the rest of my questions for later. Okay. Ms. Weeks. She was, but... Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, I just kind of wanted clarification. So, Ms. Pate, I, I would like you to repeat that again. Are any of our teachers losing their jobs? No. Okay. Anna. None of our teachers are losing their jobs. Zero. Zero. None. No. Okay. Um, and we've had to do this before when enrollment drops. We've had to not offer certain things, whether it be electives, other classes, sports, whatever, music. We've had, is this something that we've had to do before? I don't. I can answer that. Yeah. Absolutely. When my, let's see, my. 14 years down here, and then add in the seven years I was a principal at Salem High School, and the three years I worked under Dr. Saltner at Bayside Middle School. Every single year when you went through the your staffing allocations, um, the staffing allocations you received were based upon available funding at the division level, and then once you received those staffing allocations at the school level, student selection of courses drove the creation of the master schedule and the number of sections needed. So that's been the case since... 2002 when I was involved with administration. Okay, I believe you. it's always been the case. Okay, I believe so too. And I've been around about the same amount of years that you have. So I think that's true. Um, all right, Ms. Pate, of, of course I'm thrilled that the, that the General Assembly provided $500,000 for the first year of the recovery school and two hundred and fifty for the second year. That was awesome news. Um, so where would I find that in our budget, is that going to be with the funding that we've already voted for the five hundred thousand to go toward that too? So is that all going to be clumped in some? So sort right of now, other? it's it's not there. We're waiting for the when we get it. I mean, when we get, yeah. we'll be amending for the calculation tool, which will incorporate it then. Depending on the language surrounding that, um, the all likelihood that we would probably try to put it in a special revenue fund because, I mean, you know, doing a recovery school is not something you do in a few months. And so it would be something that we would want to put in a special revenue fund, which would probably the language will support that, just like they supported what we've done with the um, jewel settlement, that one portion, so that we would be able to see that on an ongoing basis in the next fiscal year. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Okay. So... I just had a couple things. So last year, um, there was discussion surrounding wellness days, and I, I, rel I recognize we're in a, um, a different situation this year than we were last year. But um, when that came up for a vote last year, one of the, um, the struggles that I had with that was that we had not even started the fiscal year yet, and then we were voting on unfilled positions and using that funding um, for wellness days. And... I was just curious, is that going to be a discussion again this year? And um, if so, is this budget um, already planning for it? So the current budget has not planned for that specifically because I don't know that their final decision has been made on wellness days. Mm -hmm. So we have done some cost calculations. HR has assisted us with that. We do have cost uh, for substitutes. and. Let me back up a little bit. Not every employee that actually takes wellness days requires a substitute. So we only need to look at those positions that require a substitute if they actually are off that day. So they've assisted us with costing that out. It's probably going to run about $1.8 to $2 million 
um, for that, and we will be able to find that money within the budget, we believe. We already have substitute costs built into the budget, so it's not like it's not already there. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm concerned about the optics of finding $1.8 million mm -hmm. when, you know, people have concerns about uh, certain things that they would like to see in the budget, and so, and that's not really, it's just a comment. It's not a question. Um, I, I understand the process. I just, it's the, it's the optics of that process yeah. as well. Yeah, I understand that. Um, I could address that. Yeah. Okay. Get some clarity. So um, the reason that it works that particular way is because there are some assumptions around the wellness days and the use of wellness days for those who need subs. Uh, one of the assumptions is by granting wellness days, um, a staff member may not choose to, to, to take an annual leave day or, per, or, or I'm sorry, personal reasons leave day or sick day, which if they would have taken those, you would have paid for the substitute anyway. Um, so in essence, the staff member is using a wellness day um, to save up an additional personal reasons late day or not use a sick day that can then carry over down the road but the cost is still the cost of the substitute. So it's, it's really difficult to get it down to how much is it really. And so when we build our budget to determine substitutes, just like you would do in your home, you, you over uh, plan for what the electricity bills are going to be on this year, hoping the electricity bills come in under. And that's what Ms. Pate is saying, that we use high high. Uh, We, we, we plan for worst case scenario with substitutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's what that is. Okay. And, I, and I do think, you know, we need to be making sure that we're not underfunding certain things. I just, and I appreciate that explanation. Um, so I, I would hope that once the funds and the calc tool come out that we have further discussion um, about what we're going to plan for. I, of course, I would love to see raises, but um, I, I want to um, have some more discussions about that. And if city council is um, to not um, make those two cent reductions, I, I do believe there are a couple of reductions in there that are worth us still moving forward. So I'd like that to be a further conversation as well. Um, and then you know, my, my other thing is, is the staffing ratio. I don't know if maybe we can take a look at not changing the staffing ratio, um, if some of those funds um, could cover that. I, I think those are further conversations mm -hmm. that we're going to need to know how much money we're looking at first. Um, and then I just have one question for Dr. Robertson, um, because I've looked at the um, information for the arts and musics and... Um, to me, it does seem very enrollment-based. Um, there are some classes that have two or 300 people asking for it, and then we have some classes with zero, some with one, some with three. I mean, I, I don't know, um, you know, as a board member, I don't know that I can recommend having a class with one or three students. Um, but I, I'm just curious, are we staffing the music and arts any differently than we've ever done it based on enrollment this year? I don't have historical data to determine what the classroom floor was for the okay. art programs. Um, I thought I recall the, the floor at one point was, was 18 or 19, and the floor now in those classes are 17. So, but I, I, without the information, uh, hypothetically, I, it's, it's about it's 17 right now. That's what I can say that it is. Okay. All right. And I, I'm just... I really am curious. The only um, pause I have here, and based on what I'm seeing, I understand all of it. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear surrounding it from certain areas that um, the, the data does not seem to um, support. But um, I am concerned just a few years after COVID um, how we're getting back into these buildings, you know, we still have some virtual Virginia students, um, you know, and that's great that we can offer that, but um, I'm, I'm concerned that 
perhaps those programs haven't had as much opportunity um, to get back to a point of flourishing again. And so I, I would be um, interested in having more conversations there. So thank you. Um, I had a question. So um, extending the maintenance landscape services, do you know what the current cycle is um, I and I what it, it would be? Thirteen to fifteen currently would go to sixteen to eighteen days. Um, days. days. And we would go to sixteen to eighteen. Oh yeah. Okay. I worry about the littles at an elementary school. The grass gets really high really fast, and um, some of the schools, like the one in my neighborhood, backs up to the woods, and so I, I worry about critters and all the other little things. So it's almost three weeks. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. It's just little things you don't think of, right? And the impact on the school. Yes, we understand. Especially out, outdoor PE. Okay, anybody else? Oh, Ms. Owens. Um, your question kind of uh, sparked side conversation and question with the uh, uh, landscaping services. Uh, with those cycles, is that consistent throughout the year or are there times in the year where we are already spacing because maybe the grass isn't growing as much and uh, times when we were doing something different yeah so how the so obviously those days like you suggest are dedicated around grass cutting um, I've learned a lot about Dallas grass uh, mm -hmm. being in this uh, role you guys may remember that grows really fast in the late summer early fall when the temperatures are high and it's really wet um, so um, that becomes problematic for our outdoor learning environments um, when it grows that fast. When that uh, season subsides in fall, and you, so you can see the grass where it doesn't grow, that maintenance team is now doing other things uh, to maintain the buildings, and there's a whole host of them. So what's, what's interesting is that group, um, it's, it essentially functions like a contract with the city, and we have, we try to be low key for what we do, um, but what we're understanding now related to landscape services is there's a large um, a knowledge gap in what they actually do. And there's a ton of work that they actually do when you look at, it, at all the beds and how they get maintained. Everything around those buildings is all being maintained by our team, including fields and other things. So that work shifts from the cutting cycle to all of the work to maintain other things around our buildings, the landscape around the buildings that's not cutting the grass, including field uh, field maintenance for athletics, that kind of stuff. Gotcha. So those um, cycles will all be extended too. Yeah, and it won't be as painful and as visible um, uh, when we're not in the cutting season. Uh, the cutting season, and it, it's particularly challenging in the fall when you get a rainy week or two, when it's still growing fast because uh, that puts everything behind cycle and it's hard to recover from once it gets that long. Okay, um, I guess one more time with the grass. Uh, for our schools that have summer programs versus schools that don't, is there a way to kind of swap out some of that and maybe have the, the schools that have elementary kids present in the summer getting a little bit more mowing and the kid, schools that don't have anybody there I mean, the community, the community will always use our um, grounds, but maybe spacing those ones out and giving more to the students who have to be present. Yeah, that's a great point. So essentially what you're saying is, hey, if they're doing maintenance at school and there's no kids, do we really need to go do that one if we have this other one that is looking long and needs attention? Absolutely. We like them to look all pretty, but if that's not the case, maybe we can uh, save a couple dollars here and there this summer. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, the pretty, the pretty is key because my neighborhood's going to freak out with, <laughs> you know, grass that tall. Um, it's, it's hard when you have a school in your neighborhood. Yeah. All right, Ms. Riggs. So back to the grass, um, <laughs> Mr. Freeman, um, that, that budget, and you might have said it might have been in it, but I might have missed it. Has that budget increased from last year to like everything else exponentially it, do you know by how much not exponentially but it did go up uh for next year you remember that i don't know i i don't recall but i know when we looked at it initially it's gone up the last three years okay yeah all right i figured that okay 
Thank you. Was that included, Dr. Robertson, in your cost of doing business, the $12.7 million difference? Or was that just instructional? Yes. It was. It was across the board. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Turn it over to Mr. Freeman. All right. Mr. Freeman, welcome. All right. Good afternoon again. Uh, all right. So we had some good discussions at our last meeting. Uh, and here's the proposed funding summary. The vast majority of questions to this point have been focused on new construction projects. As a refresher, the most significant part of this proposed CIP is the shift in emphasis towards maintenance projects. We've briefed you many times on now on the underfunding and loss of buying power in the CIP, HVAC, re-roofing, foundation, and fire alarm replacement projects, for example, have been underfunded, and this CIP attempts to put us on a recovery path for maintenance. Historically, half of the annual appropriations, so 63.8 for this year, is that total appropriations will go to maintenance and half to new construction. So with roughly 64 million, that's roughly 32 million that in the past would have gone to maintenance and 32 million that would have gone to new construction. For this CIP, we've increased the rate, the maintenance portion to roughly 44 million and the new construction to roughly 19 million. So about $12 million more going to the maintenance projects that we've historically done. In addition to that 12 million, about 15 million has been shifted out of the Bayside High School project to support HVAC, re-roofing, foundations, and fire alarm replacements. This money will be used to complete projects we have planned for this summer and will enable the proper planning and design to support maintenance projects for next summer and beyond. For the new construction projects, we must maintain those in the CIP because we are still receiving invoices to close out the interim agreement. We are on track to remove Bayside High School from this list for next year's CIP if that remains the will of the board. After working with our budget team in the city, there is one adjustment made to this page in the CIP. The six-year appropriations and the appropriations to date for Princess Anne High School have been reduced by 11 million from what's in the book. So it now properly reflects a little bit over 125 million in the Prince Anne High School six-year appropriations and 113 in the Prince Anne High School appropriations to date. Given concerns some of you expressed about approving the estimated size and cost of new construction projects, we've shared with you several times what that could look like and how the school board maintains control for how we move forward. We've added language to the pages in the CIP that reference new constructions. So if you look at the red rectangular box at the bottom of the page, it's small print, likely very hard to read, so I'm going to read it. Total project cost slash new construction amount is partly based on 2023 educational specifications. Educational specifications and the associated designs will be reviewed under a separate process with the school board, which may result in a change in square footage and cost. New construction projects will not go out for bid without school board approval separate from this CIP. It's what we've been sharing with you as we've been proceeding up to this. We're just trying to make it very clear as part of written in the CIP what the process looks like moving forward. And that language has also been included in the CIP resolution. And here's the proposed funding slide. No changes here. And for moving forward, I'll just uh, you've seen this a couple of times now. So we're just going to continue to reiterate. To reiterate. Uh, we, pr we propose that we come to you at future school board meetings to review the educational specifications and the current design of the priority school. Uh, receive direction from the school board for areas to explore reductions. Uh, then staff will develop options based upon school board guidance and reduce the size of those designs. Return to the school board with recommendations reflected in school board guidance. Then proceed to 100% design. And we're targeting 2026 for the start of new construction. If the school board decides to go in an entirely different direction related to new construction, all those options remain on the table. In summary, the CIP shifts our priority towards funding much needed maintenance 
projects like HVAC, re-roofing, foundation, and fire alarms. The CIP will enable us to execute our planned projects this summer and enable a greater number of projects to be executed next summer. For new constructions, all options remain on the table for the board prior to proceeding any further with design or construction. I think I'll leave it on that slide then for questions. Ms. Manning. This may, for, may be for Ms. Pate, I'm not sure, but it's relative to the CIP. Um, any of the additional funds from the state that we're getting, can we potentially use those for CIP projects? Only if we make that request go into the city. So usually um, we would have to request that to go into the CIP. Right now the targets are, are set at, at what they are and our debt service is set at what it is. So if we ask for any of that, we would have to act, make that request and, and amend the budget. So we were going to come back to you and to amend anyway. It's yeah, we just have some, to do that anyway, we do, right? Right. Okay. We just have to make that as part of the request. But um, the, I mean, there's obviously certain allocations that we have to put towards certain projects, but are, is there money that we could potentially use for If CIP? it comes through. I mean, okay. things like English language learners and compensation, those are tied to right. what, they, what they say. So, yes. Okay. That, that's something that I think we should definitely look at. Thank you. Mr. Callan. Okay, my first question is, since we're covering this in workshop, and we'll be covering it again in information, and we'll be covering it again in action, I don't know when is the appropriate time to ask questions pertinent to this, so I'll start now and you tell me whether or not it's the inappropriate time. There's so much that surrounds this process that's challenging and puzzling and disturbing. And I'm going to try and lay out a bit of a puzzle and ask you to make it all fit. Concern number one deals with the current square footage in the buildings under consideration and the proposed square footage. And as you've heard from many of us, that's just disturbing. And in the past, it was, we might have found out what the square footage was from col column A, but we didn't know how it compared to column B, but now we have that. Or at least I've been able to, to gather that information in some of the conversations I've had. Betty F. Williams, Bayside 6, for example, if we take each of those two separate and combine them, the total square footage combined is 134,172. What's proposed is 184,000, or a 37% increase in square footage. Causes you to be a little hesitant. Princess Anne High School currently is 228,860. Proposed, 344,000, or a 50% increase. More angst. Lastly, Bayside High School, currently 200,816, proposed 340,000, or a 69% increase. So when you wrestle with all that surrounds this budget and all of the dollars that we're trying to A, receive, and then B, allocate, and the things that we're considering eliminating in the course of achieving a balanced budget, these are some of the things that cause us to be concerned. I shouldn't say us, me. I can only speak for me. Secondly, is part of what you were addressing a few moments ago, and that has to do with the fact that the dollars that were coming in, hypothetically, we were going to allocate them 50% to maintenance and 50% to new building construction. Sounds like what we're realizing is, to use your sinking ship analogy, the maintenance is so demanding in light of the accelerating effects of inflation that instead of a 50-50 split, we're now achieving, a, we need about 70% of the dollars coming in versus 30% for new buildings and 70% for maintenance. So again, that causes alarm and angst. But here's where I discovered something that caused me to sit up and take notice. In what I've heard, 
and I'm going to ask you to clarify if that's a correct hearing. But what I've heard is the fact that if we don't move forward with the CIP budget as it currently exists, despite these areas of concern, that somehow or another we will be missing out on approximately $25 million that could be made available for maintenance-related projects that will not be. So that's a long-winded lead-in to the question, and that is, A, is what I'm hearing from your perspective accurate? B, if in fact the $25 million would be absent if we don't proceed, can you walk me through the math that may be available from the overwhelming amount of information that exists in trying to put this puzzle together? Can you walk me through the math that allows me to see we started with this, and if we don't do this, we lose 25 mil? Other than that, I have no other questions. Yeah. Yes, and oh man, that's a meaty one. Um, so, um, to start with a backdrop of what you described, and I'll kind of go in reverse order of kind of the way that you uh, presented the, the puzzle. So, um, we have shared with you. Um, for, with the board for the last couple of years that um, we uh, have had a loss of buying power due to declining slash level funding to our CIP. We've shared that slide with you several times. It has a bumper sticker in the bottom that says $900 million loss in buying power from roughly 2009 throughout the six-year CIP. So given a 50-50 funding for new construction and maintenance, roughly a $450 million loss in buying power related to maintenance. And uh, we recognized uh, several years ago that it's not sustainable. Um, so something has to change. If funding doesn't change, which it has not, we're at a level CIP funding again uh, this year, then we have to look at priorities. We need to maintain our buildings. Um, and we've done various cost analysis to be able to talk about you know, how much did eggs cost in 2009 versus how much eggs cost today. It's a, to be able to explain that the inflation effect is real and it's being felt everywhere and we need to be able to prioritize the projects. We've also shared with the school board our inability to be able to fund HVAC and it's on the order of 25 to 33% of our uh, HVAC um, projects that we're able to fund moving forward. We've shared that with you multiple times. We've shared that the re-roofing is somewhere between 40 and 50% of our ability to be able to fund the re-roofing projects. Um, foundations, we got several foundations that need work, and we have fire alarm replacements. So those are big projects that require large dollars. So that shift in funding, quite honestly, we don't know that that's going to put us on a 10-year path. We want a 10-year recovery path mm -hmm. to be able to recover from the maintenance that we haven't been able to do on those projects. This will put us on that path, and we're still doing the investigation to see whether that funding amount will put us on the right path to be able to get there. But this is a really good step in the right direction. So that's the, the funding piece shifting towards prioritizing maintenance. Uh, I'm going to hold off on the, on the school stuff, and I'm going to kind of leverage into the, because the question that you asked was roughly in the 25 to 27 million that I talked about in the, in the script about we moved $15 million from Bayside High School into those key maintenance areas. And there's about $12 million more that we're funding from the annual allocations this year into maintenance that we otherwise wouldn't have done in the past. So that's that 25 to $27 million that we're talking about that increase. Okay. So part of your question is, what would happen if the school board doesn't approve this? Uh, I think that was that the question of, if we don't adopt this recommendation and send it to uh, city council, what happens? Is that what you meant by that question of, what happens to that 25 to 27 million? Well, under the premise, and I may be repeating myself, so please forgive me, but under the premise that if we can't build new buildings, let's use Princess Anne High School, my alma mater, if we can't rebuild a 70 year old school building, and if we start to lower the amount of dollars that are available for maintenance and repair to a 70 year old building, that's a recipe for disaster that anybody can see coming. 
but that's what I'm trying to validate or confirm. Is that a correct understanding? Because I, I get the numbers with Princess Anne and Bayside High School being stunningly astronomical. That's too big to build. That only necessitates that school buildings have to be maintained in order to remain safe and healthy for kids to be in. But again, I'm just trying to reiterate, you've given me the math now, and that is if we don't pass this budget, we're going to be reducing the amount of money available for maintenance that's terribly needed in an age where we can't build new buildings. I think that's a fair enough way to word it without going into the details, that that is true. And uh, to leverage that, I think it's fair to say that the older buildings get the more maintenance that they require um, and the cost associated with it. So I think that's all fair. Okay. Um, you asked about the concern related to current square footage versus uh, future square footage. That is an absolutely wonderful discussion. Um, that's what we were attempting to do at the January 9th brief when we shared education specifications and um, the uh, designs of the three buildings. That is fully our intention to be able to go down into those kind of discussions with what we've proposed to come back to the school board and get guidance. So for that, we've got on the, four, uh, on the quarterly forecast for April 16th to come back to you to have that discussion, if it's the will of the board, around Betty F. and Bayside 6, and start to go through that process. And all of that information, because there's a million different compare. I don't want to say that. It's overstatement. There's a lot of different comparisons that are being made, and we want to get the experts back in front of you and facilitate that conversation related to the education specifications and the design, and then get guidance from you for where to go look to reduce. So time is available for future examination. 100%. Okay. And it, when you say time is available, make, make it very clear, it is available for however the school board wants to approach it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Brown. Um, so you mentioned April 16th. Um, when you say the experts coming back in front of us, do you mean um, brain spaces? Okay. And the architect. Okay. Um, so we, we really, um, I think, well, I'm going to speak for myself. I, I think we do really need to look at the sizing. Um, there and uh, the square footage and I I don't know was brain spaces contracted through us or um, part of the interim agreement with the um, contractor so they were contracted through the interim agreement anything that we do with them moving forward will not be part of the interim agreement okay um, I just I do feel like that we need to have that conversation but um, I just want to make sure that they come prepared to have that conversation. Um, I don't think if you want to change the size of your building, you need to change uh, your mission as a district is um, accurate. Um, and, and that was what was presented. You know, if you want a smaller building, then you need to change your, your vision. Um, uh, if I may. That was not what was intended to be shared, and that was not shared by anybody from Brain Spaces or otherwise. What I personally shared was what was being delivered was delivered in a way that was in line with what the school board directed. Mm -hmm. The school board last year directed go do the educational specifications. Everything that was done was made within the values and priorities of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, meaning get public feedback before you make decisions on what you're going to do Take that public feedback and don't just take the public feedback and unfiltered put good expertise behind it which uh, and be able to reduce it to what we need from a programming standpoint and a building standpoint and then you will have your final product so brain spaces or nobody else what what and I could be wrong the way that I took this but it was a hey, they might not be in the right mindset to be able to engage in a conversation. I want to make it very clear that it was me that talked about everything was based on values and priorities for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So, for example, CTE spaces in were a large portion of the two high schools. That was direct 
feedback direction from school board, city council, the community, we want to do this. And it had a substantial impact. That's a value and priority that would need to be readdressed by the school board and say, do we still value it and prioritize it in the same way? So that was meant, was meant by that, and that is all on me and has nothing to do with brain spaces mindset when they came. So it, it wasn't something that you said, so I will, I will follow up, but um, I just, I want to make sure that the conversation is, is on how we can really truly investigate um, space saving um, and cost savings. And so that's, that's all that I'm um, pushing for. So yep. thank you. So again, I'll, I'll just follow up with that one. At the end of that January 9th brief, there was a specific slide that was designed exactly around that that uh, uh, Mike presented that was, hey, here's the size of CTE spaces. Here's the size of uh, uh, gymnasiums and other uh, areas that the school board could pursue and say, do we really still value those things in the same way that we did? So that actually existed on the January 9th presentations as well, and that's what we intend to come back. The whole reason for coming back to you is to be able to show you categories of places where to be able to look and understand what the con consequences are. And I mean con consequences in a neutral term. If we do this, how much cost savings will, will we get and what's the impact on our learning environment? And you put all those things together with your values and priorities and then say, well, let's look at, take a look at this first before we take a look at this. Ms. Williams? Um, yes, thank you. And I look forward to those conversations because I, I do think when we're talking about the, the public's or the school division's values and priorities, I know I attended some of those meetings and, and I, I don't recall the public ever being asked about cost or, you know, or square footage. And so it would be interesting to see if you ask the public, do you think it's feasible or wise to build a building 60% larger than existing? I think that we would have some interesting conversations and, and some answers to that. So I'll look forward to that conversation, but I do hope that when we go out to, to the public or make those conversations, many of us have talked about size and price, so I hope that's, that's in that, but that, that'll be something for a later date. I do want to say, you know, bottom line is I, I appreciate the verbiage that you have added to the CIP and that red line. We've been talking about it, but I think it's very important for the public to actually be able to read it and see it as well as I appreciate um, Mr. Freeman and Dr. Robertson, the verbiage that you added to the resolution that we will be talking about later. Um, we have had many discussions in the last couple of days about areas that I have had heartburn on, and um, I think this makes it very, very easy to understand that the, that the cost of new construction was based on our 23 um, education specifications and then all designs in the future are going to be reviewed by us in a separate you know, process, and that could cha change, and I personally hopefully hope that it does change, the square footage and the cost, and the new construction projects, none of them will go out to bid without approval from us and from a vote. So for you to add that into the language, I really do appreciate you listening to some of us and doing that. Thank you very much. So while I agree with Ms. Weems, I, I do want to say that I would never go out to the public and I just invite anyone who has not been at, at Bayside 6th grade campus and who has not been at Betty F. Williams and tell me that those schools should remain the same square footage. Those are small schools. Those kids are tight in those buildings and anyone who is there and sees it is there for for movement in those buildings um, really needs to be careful because when Kellum High School was built, it was not the same size when it was rebuilt. When we redid Thoroughgood, it was not the same size. When we redid Princess Anne Middle School, it was not the same size. And we now cannot send a message to this community, and we had no more money then. We cannot send a message to this community now that the children that are at Bayside 6 and Betty F deserve the exact same square footage because, oh, now we, we can't make this work. And um, I invite you to go to Princess Anne High School on a bell change or Bayside High School at a bell change uh, where I was recently and 
you would not be saying, people would not be saying what we're saying right now. I, I know money is an issue, but we really need to be realistic um, about these buildings. And I, I just caution my colleagues, please do not take that away from a community. Um, never have we ever, when we speak to the community, mention square footage and cost. It, that's, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to ask what the community wanted and what they needed. And then it is our job to come back and do value engineering afterwards. And this process is just a little backwards, especially for someone who does this for a living. And so it's very difficult for me to sit and, and listen, although I understand the money piece, but I, I, I'm very sensitive about about that message that's being sent to the Bayside community. Ms. Bunner, can I yeah. uh, just one other comment related? Because we've, we've heard it a couple times. I just want to make sure that the public understands what the process is. Because when we hear things like um, the process was never given cost information, the impression that it uh, can leave is you just ask for the moon and see what you get, and that it was given to them. And that's not the case. So for example, um, there was a planetarium that was requested at uh, Bayside High School, the first meeting. There was a waterfall that was requested. Those didn't even wind up in, in the in initial portions of the design. Um, in addition to that, the programs were looked at over time, and they were reduced in size. And there was an example of Betty F. and Bayside 6 and how that was done. And there was a visual that was shared as part of the January 9th presentation, and I think another one uh, after that. Um, additionally, on uh, August 6th, August 5th, um, we brought in just uh, senior members of the group that would understand programming related to all three schools. So small portion of uh, central support staff and brought in principals and others to be able to specifically look at what do we really need and let's cut down to what we absolutely need. And with that group, we got to that size. So another indication that it's not just a request that came from somebody that's disassociated with a benefit uh, that we see in values and priorities of Virginia Beach City Public Schools that made it into the design. That was all looked at by experts in ed their educational fields who work for Virginia Beach City Public Schools to say, yes, this is what we believe that we need based on the values and priorities uh, of Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Now, that isn't to say that it can't change, and that's why we have all these uh, programs that are set up or uh, processes to be able to review it going forward. Um, but that information uh, about they weren't aware of what the cost was of those, those were all vetted out at a point later on if it wasn't appropriate. Yes. Ms. Williams. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, I'm disappointed that my words are completely being twisted up here. I have never, ever, 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 never, ever said the Bayside community deserves buildings the same exact size. The same exact size. My kids attended those schools for 30 something years. I live in the community. I've been in every one of those schools. I frankly just said that perhaps we don't need to be building schools 60% larger. So I would appreciate that my words not be twisted up here. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I share those concerns. I live in the Bayside community, and I, I feel the same way. We are not asking for the schools to be the same size or smaller. We're asking for them to be reasonably sized so we can afford to build new schools for our community and so that we don't bankrupt our citizens. Um, we have people struggling to pay their rent, and that's why I've been so opposed to these astronomical sizes and costs of these buildings, because our community who pays for these buildings cannot afford it. So I don't appreciate the rhetoric that we want to harm the community by reducing the size of the school, because that's just not true. I thank you. Um, anybody else? Ms. Anderson? So, um, <clears throat> I was just shown a bill, and I'm not sure that this is the right time to talk about it, but it was this House Bill 805 and Senate Bill 14 that passed that allowed locals to 
enact a, a local sales tax that would go directly toward building new schools. Are you familiar with that? So I'm not familiar with exactly how it's going to work, but do we need to get city council's approval to do that? How, how is that going to happen or if it can happen? If it comes through the governor, um, what will happen is it'll have to go through a referendum and be on the November ballot to be presented to the voters for a vote. It's a it's a bill that the locality would actually um, put that increase out there, but the voters will have to approve that that goes through. So it has to go through a referendum and be on the ballot. So I've been saying all along that we need we need a revenue coming into our locality that allows us to. Uh, bank some money and put forward some money that we can build schools because with the amount of money that's coming in now it's obviously not enough even if we lower the square footage of our schools the, the, the price of these schools is still astronomical we really do need to have um, this particular sales tax and I, I don't I don't want to be labeled as oh here comes Bev again she's going to enact another tax on us but you know what I've yet to find out how we could build schools without paying for them. And so our locality needs to understand that if we want to have quality schools and we want to build schools with 86 schools, if we only build one per year, it's 86 years before we get back to another one. Okay, so all of that information needs to be put out to the public so the public understands that we have to pay for these schools to be built. And yes, the cost of building schools is higher than it was even 10 years ago. Um, and I'm not stating that we should just not pay for them. I'm stating that we need a revenue source and this this is something that we need to be pushing for uh, if, if the governor signs it. I'm hoping he's already signed it, but um, I'm hoping that he will sign it because I do know that some localities across the state are already doing this. They already had special permission to do it. So um, we need to have that as well. And I hope um, our local population will accept something like this because this would be a source of revenue that would come in that would directly go for building schools. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So can you please just explain for the public again um, what happened because there was a time that we had state money coming in for construction so you know we've talked about this when I first got on the board we talk about this every year explain to the public what has happened um, to that funding that has kind of put us you know in this situation where we are now where we're concerned in seven years we're not going to have any funding for it. So, and is that something that we can go back at, as citizens and talk to, um, you know, the General Assembly and, and take those steps? I'm just curious, you know, speaking to Ms. Anderson's point, you know, what is it that we need to do, not only as board members, but as citizens, to, to put this back on track in terms of those monies? Is that something that we can go back to, talk to our General Assembly members? I'm sure you can have those conversations. I mean, th that money probably went away during when we went through a recession and that money just was not available. We Since then, we've received one year where we received about $15 million, but that's the only time we've received state construction money since in a very, very long time. And it's just that it's, even though General Assembly realizes that is important for this state and there's many localities that have school districts with school schools that are just in not good shape, but that has not been the funding priorities coming out of the state level. But certainly you can have those conversations. But that funding dried up after the recession. No, I know. Oh, yeah. No, I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the All in Virginia update, and welcome Danielle Colucci, Chief Academic Officer. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Melnick, Vice Chair Franklin, School Board members, and Dr. Robertson. 
My name is Danielle Colucci and I serve as the Chief Academic Officer. Today I will share an update on the progress being made to utilize uh, Virginia's funding for All in Virginia, which was given to us by the state to support addressing high intensity tutoring, chronic absenteeism, and funding for the Virginia Literacy Act provisions. As you recall, we were given $20 million from the state of Virginia. 70% of those funds were to assist us with providing high intensity tutoring in the areas of reading and math for third through eighth grade students who scored low proficient or not proficient on their most recent SOL tests. 20% were provided to uh, support us with the implementation of the Virginia Literacy Act and the remaining 10% was designated to reduce chronic absenteeism. Let's begin with reviewing high intensity tutoring. We have had a robust tutoring support system and model in place in Virginia Beach for many years. When we were provided this additional funding of all in, we were able to greatly expand existing programs and services as well as add to them. This information was reviewed with the school board in October. As of March 1st, our schools had already provided over 26,000 hours of tutoring by a paid tutor utilizing all in funding. This occurred before, after, or during school. Elementary students also have utilized Imagine Math, a digital program that offers on demand differentiated digital lessons and tutoring. The program adapts to the performance of the students so that it addresses their needs on their level. This resource was added for elementary schools this year through ESSER funding, but it was approved by the state in our spending plan for All In to continue next year. Zern was a free math resource we were provided by VDOE. It is available for kindergarten through eighth grade students for math. It has been utilized at a lower rate, but has, as you can see here, it's also been utilized and provided many lessons. Ignite was the resource initially selected for elementary and middle schools to address literacy. It did not roll out uh, from VDOE as intended, and they recently replaced it by offering school divisions in the Commonwealth a program called Lexia Core and Power Up both of which will be provided to our students until May of 2025. These programs are grounded in evidence-based literacy instruction and will be available for our students demonstrating the need for acceleration and intervention support as outlined in the Virginia All-In Playbook. We are also exploring adding varsity tutors, as was previously mentioned at a recent board meeting, which is a free on-demand tutoring resource. As the state recently announced, they have made that available to Virginia learners as well. Keeping in mind that All In expanded our approaches, we felt it was relevant to provide a glimpse of some of the other great resources that are still occurring and happening in our schools outside of the All In funding. For example, Title I federal funds are supporting us and providing paid tutors as well. So far this year, well, as of March 1st, 7,500 hours of tutoring have been provided via Title I funds. Academic support funds are also being provided and have, have funded over 12,000 hours of tutoring. FEV tutoring continues to be accessed digitally by our students for on-demand homework support and scheduled lessons. It is being accessed at a lower rate than in previous years, most likely due to how many other resources we have been providing and the robust boost we received from all in funding. Other examples of support worthy of mentioning this evening are our early literacy intervention services that are provided daily to students indicating a need for this support in early literacy foundations. Foundational reading programs are being provided such as SIPs and blended models such as Read 180 and System 44 continue to be offered to our students. 
allow me to provide you a brief update on chronic absenteeism and how we're utilizing the funds to address this problem. Mr. Delaney and Mr. Jamison recently shared our progress related to chronic absenteeism. Because of that, we won't spend too much time this evening going into this in great detail. However, we can provide a brief update. During the week of February 26th, schools received support for the initial launch of Everyday Labs, and on March 1st, initial engagement was made with families of students who have been absent 5% or more of school days enrolled, and text nudges will be sent. Our Attendance Ambassador Program also has begun at the first school identified to receive support. We will be hosting an event at the school for the four attendance ambassadors, along with their coordinator to meet the students, outline expectations, and establish rapport. Schools continue to pool their student response teams together as well to analyze data and outline interventions that will help families and students be more encouraged to have regular attendance. As was also shared during the last chronic absenteeism presentation, the VDOE is providing school divisions with the opportunity to provide flexible in-person instruction time that can be used to recover lost instructional time due to student absences. In order to meet this standard, we must ensure several guidelines are followed, and this includes that instructional time to make up for lost instructional time has to be in person, it has to be outside of the normal instructional day, and a student has to be taught by a licensed teacher. We have discussed the major impacts and shifts due to the Virginia Literacy Act. Here you see those major ones displayed, so I'm not going to review all of them again this evening. For example, we have already shared information related to the required textbook adoption with you, the Virginia Literacy and Language Screener, and middle school reading specialists. As an update, the VDOE is working to finalize the individualized student reading plan components and templates. We have not yet received those. They have also not released the specifics on the Virginia Literacy Partnership required training that principals and teachers will complete. We expect to have that information very soon though, and that will help us to finalize our division-wide literacy plan, which we will submit to you for approval, hopefully in early May, and then we will submit it to the state by the deadline in, on June 3rd. We have developed a Virginia Literacy Act strategic planning team and involved many school-based stakeholders to provide input in this development. This group is helping to develop guiding documents, a principal implementation strategy roadmap, and other helpful timelines uh, to make sure that our teachers and principals have a good sense of what support they need to plan out for. The team is working to develop um, a calendar, um, professional learning, and all of the things that our schools will need. Uh, we do want to pause and thank you for the support of a school calendar that has built-in days. Um, as you can see, there's a lot ahead of our schools as far as time needed for professional learning, getting to know their new textbook, um, the new math standards in addition. Um, a draft of the new English standards was just released in December as well. And um, as outlined in the Virginia Literacy Act, the ver proposed new standards of learning reflect the state's continued commitment to evidence-based literacy instruction for all learners. We anticipate the draft standards to be approved very soon this month. They are not yet approved. Full instructional implementation of the standards will begin this fall. However, as you are aware, when standards are revised, there is quite a domino effect. We have to adjust curriculum, pacing, provide professional learning for any changes so that teachers are aware of how to um, provide instruction to meet that standard and how to assess a standard. While standards will be instructionally implemented this fall, how the standards will be assessed um, is still to be determined. We're, we're waiting for the state to provide us information on will the SOLs be updated for this coming school year um, or will it remain the same? 
as you can see, we are experiencing a good deal of change for the upcoming school year. We will return to you in March to provide you a more comprehensive overview of the core subject curriculum updates. As we conclude this evening, we did want to share with you a spending plan update related to the three areas we've discussed this afternoon. The figures displayed here represent estimates of spending as of March 1st for each of the all-in components. Tutoring continues daily at all schools, so we know this number will continue to grow as the year progresses. Virginia Beach is in the process of issuing a purchase order for the K-3 textbook that you just approved, and the same process will take place soon for the fourth and fifth grade textbook adoption. We will not um, be paying for the materials until they are received. We have budgeted approximately $4 million to cover some of the costs associated with implementing the Virginia Literacy Act, such as the textbook adoption. The Attendance Ambassador Program is just beginning, so you will see that number begin to grow as well. As you recall, school divisions can carry over funds that are unspent at the conclusion of the 23-24 school year, and we will have a better picture of how much will be left for carryover in June. As you can see, the state's all-in initiative has made a great difference for our school division uh, and is really making an impact in the lives of our students. And that concludes this brief update. Uh, I'm available if you have any questions. Ms. Brown. Okay, so on slide six, um, when you were talking about, uh, it's the one with the Attendance Matters VA. Yes. Uh, that bottom bullet point, in-person flexible instructional time. Um, I'm kind of a, a little intrigued by that and would like more information on it. Um, so, and I think that our community might want more information. How would um, a family um, reach out to their school to start that process? They're certainly welcome to reach out. I would encourage them to contact the administration or the counselor. Um, but part of the SRT process for a student with chronic absenteeism is that it is an expectation that schools are meeting as a student response team. And so they would be taking initiative as well to reach out and offer such options. Some of these students might already be participating in a program after school with a licensed teacher. So the school could also communicate that this intervention after school is really important and it will also address um, some of the days. So they'll be doing a lot of heavy communicating. Mr. Delaney, did you want to add anything to that? No, <clears throat> excuse me, I think you covered it, but I think we're just looking at, uh, we, we told principals really take a hard look at your students that are tracking in that area of chronic absenteeism as they do, as Ms. Colucci said, with SRT meetings and begin that process of finding opportunities for them to come before or after school or even on Saturdays. She makes an important point. I'm just going to reinforce it. Many of these students might be in all in Virginia tutoring in the morning or after school, and you can utilize this opportunity as well to attack the chronic absenteeism. Last thing I'll say on it is you can only go up to 15 days. Now, that's a lot, mm -hmm. so I think, I think we're all comfortable with that number, but there is some limitations on how much you can do. And finally, what I will say, I think I said that already, but again, I will say, they won't change their absences right away. So I'll use you as an example, Ms. Brown, your child misses a day, they go get this in-person flexible tutoring, and you're wondering why their absence still shows. It'll still show. At the end of the year, they'll run a report of who attended this in-person flexible instruction, and you can reduce your chronic absenteeism numbers on that end. So I think that's a key communication standpoint if you're interacting with, uh, with your constituents on. It's not gonna erase it, you're not gonna see a zero, or go from 12 to 10 because we still want to have that data, but it just gives the state some flexibility on we've at least put interventions into a support learning loss that may have existed when a student wasn't there. And follow up on part of the SRT process, when you when we run out of options at the school, that's when we go to court. 
We filed 32 cases last week alone, just to give you. So they are working through that. The courts have given us extra time, but that was last week alone. That Those are the cases that we were not able to resolve at the school level, and we're into court. So, and that's just one week alone to let you know they are following through with those families that are not cooperating with our programs. And there are a series of steps in policy that um, we implement as intervention before we get to that point, hoping not to get to that point. Um, and can you remind me how many days is considered chronic absenteeism? It's uh, more than 10% of the year um, is what hits that. Now, if you heard in Ms. Colucci's comments around Everyday Labs, which is the program we're using, they are sending out messages for anybody from anywhere from 5% to 95%. And Mr. Jamison and I meet with Everyday Labs pretty much bi-weekly to see how the rollout is going. We had a meeting today. Uh, a text nudge went out to parents today of that group, so we've given one email. The next te text nudge went out today. I share that in case anybody contacts you wondering why these are coming out. And in those, we give some data information on them. We're going to do the next one right after spring break. And there's informational pieces that go along with that as well, such as get better sleep, set goals heading into the fourth quarter. So I, you're giving me an opportunity to share a lot of information here, so I'm going to take advantage of it. But that we're hitting them much earlier than waiting to that 10% range. And um, <clears throat> there is also one other thing, Ms. Brown, is there's an enrollment deadline on, you might ask, when does that end? Like if a student enrolls in April, what counts for them? That they would not be on that chronic absenteeism list. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just one final thing is um, the impact on instructional staff for the flexible instructional time. Um, is there any uh, concerns about that? I mean, we mentioned Saturdays. Is that being covered on Saturday with um, existing structures that are in place? Um, yeah, as a former principal, I would absolutely use existing structures. Um, most uh, all of our schools um, right now do have uh, some type of support. They might develop something extra based on the all-in funding that can support them in addressing this. But if your question is more out of concern, will teachers feel obligated that they have to do extra, that none of that would be mandated. It would be a choice, and they would be paid for that. Okay, thank you. Ms. Elliott. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure I understood the uh, instructional time that uh, kind of the makeup time that they're able to get before or after school can help uh, ultimately cancel out some of the absences, mm -hmm. but only at the end of the school year. Is that for um, secondary level students as well? And is the uh, you know, miss 10 days, need a waiver uh, situation that we have for our secondary students. Is that something that they can do makeup time there, or is that totally separate? Those would be separate. So we still want to follow our school board policy around waivers and things such as that. Uh, because as I said, you cannot remove those absences. It's a report that's run at the end of the year. So we expect our schools to continue the SRT process, continue the waiver process. Um, really, I think what the goal of in-person flexible instruction was, was to help not only school divisions meet that chronic absenteeism and accreditation standard, but provide opportunities for kids to get that work done and completed and the learning and prepared and assist in their overall grades. There is time requirements um, for elementary school, I believe it's three hours, mm -hmm. and high school is two, or am I uh, flip that? First. Two hours mm -hmm. elementary school, three hours high school to get that number. So there is a time requirement uh, that builds up. I hope that made sense, Ms. Yes, yeah, it did. Um, so kind of what I'm thinking, if, if I'm a secondary student, if I'm in high school and I've, for whatever reason, missed 11 days this uh, time period, if I'm on the quarter or the semester, whatever, and so now I'm going to need a, a waiver to be able to uh, get credit for the class, are we, as a district, typically approving those waivers with whatever excuse is given? And if not, is there truly an incentive for the student to come and do the makeup time for it to go to the state when we are not going to give them credit for passing the class anyway? 
I think we would work with our principals on that level of flexibility, to be honest with you. I think we do give, grant them an opportunity to have a, a good conversation with students on how they can earn that time. I do, you know, we, to be honest, we haven't had a strict conversation where the ruling is there, and I'll talk to Dr. Robertson, but typically we provide that level of flexibility and engaging with students around why they've missed that time. And I think you provide a great example of what's the motivation for the student if you're going to tell me I'm still going to fail the course. Right. So we, we, that, that goes through the SRT process. It goes through a lot of other avenues where principals try to use some judgment on what they expect students to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know that this is new stuff that we right. are implementing. Um, so if that's something that uh, can just be all handled with the flexibility or if there's something that needs to come kind of board level with some boundaries around when you know we're, we're approving them and when we're not it, but it does seem like a, a motivational deterrent uh, for students to come and do this makeup work for the state at absenteeism and even for parents to get students to school on a Saturday if they're gonna have to take those classes again anyway yeah we're being very realistic that, that the Saturday might be a reach when we look at the secondary end and there's activity buses and things that can potentially take students home that can't access that transportation, we've, we've pushed a lot of that as well as in the middle school level, the mornings where there's some time where a parent might be able to bring a student in before they go to work. The incentive also comes though from the fact that a student no longer feels like they're behind and the grades begin to improve, which then we know then increases the likelihood they're going to come to school every day if they feel like there's an avenue for them to improve. Mm -hmm. Quite often students start seeing their attendance drop, grades drop, and go, there's, there's nothing I can do at this point, and so they no longer come. So we do believe there's some motivation once they see some improvement in grades that they'll start coming on a, a more regular basis. We hope anyway. Right. And hopefully the parents are, are seeing that as well, um, but balancing those intrinsic motivational things with the, the extrinsic uh, motivation that they're, they're seeing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And our last item this evening is changing the date of school board regular meetings. Welcome, Mrs. Linetti, school board attorney. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, school board members, and Dr. Robertson. I'm Cami Linetti, and I'm bringing to you a topic. This is a discussion. So I want to give you a little bit of a background how we got to where we were and why we're bringing this up to, for your review at this time. We were asked by a school board member to, to, to find out what it would cost us to bring in more video services for other committee meetings. And in the process of researching that, we were in touch with the city's communications office about the VBTV contract that we have. It took us a little while to do some research on that. We have a MOU for video services. It goes back to 1992, so it took us some time to look at it. I was vaguely familiar with this and didn't know a lot about it, um, what the actual terms are of it. We were speaking with Tiffany Jacobs, who's the city's communications officer, and she said, well, it just so happens that I'm going through a lot of reorganization in my office. I'm having to consider the time. This would be a good time to talk about this. In addition, the city handles the Cox Cable franchise contract. That particular contract deals with how we get BBTV, um, the city channels on there, how that's paid for. It comes to a public education grant that is a tax on the cable services that individuals have, and that has to be dedicated towards certain types of public education. While they're looking at that particular contract, which uh, franchise agreement, which is overdue, we needed to take some look as to what our intentions were with these stations in the future. So we sat down as a group. Dr. Saltner was at, Ms. Livis was here, Mr. Din was involved in it. I sat down with it, and we were talking with the city. And one of the things the city is pointing out to us is that um, Ms. Jacobs has I'm sorry, Russell, I keep saying, oops. Ms. Russell is saying to us that um, sheer staffing is being cut. She has individuals that are retiring that have handled this. The demands that she is facing from the new procedures that they follow in the city are cutting into the time available for her staff to be able to be here and help us. As we know, our meetings are going longer, too, and we were at the initially talking about the fact that we might need to if we wanted to cover uh, some of our committee meetings, what would take on her staff. And at this time, she's having to look at what's available to her and what her staff can do, and she's got a lot of demands on it. So one of the things that we talked about was whether we should consider breaking out services, if there was additional staff. We've talked about that. At this time, we weren't necessarily looking at that. 
And she said, well, if you want my staff to keep doing it, um, I'm getting demands on my time and my staff's time with limited time. Would the school board be open to considering moving its meeting to a different day of the week because then her staff would be more available? She's already committed. Now, as you know, she's got staff doing city council at the same time you're doing school board meetings. They've got board of commissioners. They have other meetings to do that. And I said to her, well, that's a board decision. We need to bring that back to the board. That's a big decision. And we're obviously, we've set your meetings for the year. It affects a lot of other things. So she, we thought it'd be best to just bring it to you to start opening that discussion. Is this something you're willing to discuss or not? Because what's happening is um, Ms. Russell has to get back to the city council and a couple other things about some options for how she can run her department in the future. So she needs to know whether this is something we're open to considering. We made it very clear at this time we, did, we are not prepared on July 1 to do that. Um, because we haven't planned for this, we've set our meetings, but this would be something we would have to consider. So I'm just opening the floor to you at this time to have this discussion, whether this is something we can get back to or is it something you're willing to consider or just know that is not something you're willing to consider. And she will then take it back to um, her managers and decide what she needs to do with that in the city council. We are in the middle of still discussing other things. There's a lot that goes into video services. The technology is changing dramatically. How people are accessing this information is changing dramatically and we're going to have to look at some of those issues. So I'm throwing this out to you now and I don't know if Ms. Livers, if you want to join in. It turns out Ms. Livers has a whole lot of background in the technology on this. Uh, and so she was very familiar with the conversation about how we're changing the technology and what we'll be doing in the future and what the needs might need for it. So I don't know if live if you want to throw in any more about what the potential is for how we would be doing services in the future. Yeah, it's really just a matter of streamlining the equipment, like how we can broadcast from here. Uh, they they need to make a change at City Hall. So we have to decide if we're going to keep the, the same date or move it. And of course, as uh, Ms. Linetti said, there are some restrictions there. But technology has just evolved, and uh, you know, there's some things that we are able to do. We don't need all the equipment that we've had before. And again, when we're looking at staff, you know, cutting staff, you know, we're cutting equipment too. So it's trying to find that that happy medium. And again, this is not a final decision. She needs to get a report out. So she wanted to know if this is, an, is a potential for a discussion. So we're bringing that to you. We are still meeting, I think, about roughly monthly with them about different areas of this and how they can handle it, and then she'll have to do some recommendations. So I'm throwing it out to you as to the, whether this is something you want to consider, participate in a dialogue about this, or whether this is just a no-go for you so we can get back to her about it. Um, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to, to hear this topic uh, coming at least for discussion. Uh, I will say that, like many of us, have already adjusted my schedule around the, the Tuesday date, and so certainly it would require some adjustments, uh, but broader than my own schedule. I do think this, this was a topic that was discussed uh, within my first uh, three or four months on the board. and in a workshop setting like this, and I was asking, well, well, why are we doing them this day? And it was, well, because we always have done them this day. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a disservice to our constituents to make them have to choose if they're going to uh, participate in a school board meeting or participate in a city council meeting, that they can't be two places at one time, and our, our meetings are overlapping frequently. It's a disservice to some of us who may want to participate in city council uh, meetings and attend. And so if there is a, another day that would work, um, I think it's certainly worth the consideration despite the, the shuffling that people will, will need to do. I'm sure our administrative staff, same thing, have worked their lives around this date. Um, but once we get it up and moving, people will adjust and rework their lives around the other date that we choose. Um, so those are my thoughts. I, I hope that we will have serious consideration of that, particularly if it's going to free up uh, the ability for us to have committee sessions or other things uh, broadcast because we'll have more access. Ms. Mamie. I agree with everything that Ms. Owens just said. Um, and in addition to that, I'm not clear. Are we doing this because that's the way we get our committees broadcast, or 
we're going to need to do this anyway type of she thing. Need, as I was bringing up the topic, she said, I'm running, she has individuals that are retiring, they're not replacing some of her staff members. Um, there are more demands that they're being asked to staff more and more meetings, some of the district hall things and things that you're seeing happening. She just doesn't have enough staff to get there to all the meetings. So when we brought it the committee discussion, she also mentioned, you know, she, she may not have the amount of staff that she had in the future. You usually have one or two individuals that are over here with us, and is there a better way to do their staffing? How can we do that? So she, she has thrown out Thursday as a potential day for us on there because that's not a day that they have other meetings on that she could be able to get her staff over here. Now, if we went to committees, we would be, that's another conversation that we're having with them. We're meeting on almost monthly basis. There are different ways to do that, whether you use the, um, the cable channels or you do the streaming services. That's another possibility for us, which doesn't necessarily require the same amount of staffing. So we're looking at that. Right now, what she indicated to us is the city had done a survey, and the individuals, there are there is a group of individuals that continue to use the, the cable channel services, and they tend to be older individuals, perhaps, that are not as familiar with the streaming services. So they, at this time, the city feels that, that continuing to provide the cable services, and they're saying that, that's what drives a lot of the equipment and things that we're doing, the choices on that. As those individuals may no longer be using service and we're going to more digital, it would give us more options on how to do some of the stuff. So we're talking in early stages of talking about are there other ways to do committees? What, who, depending on the type of service you use. If you were doing a Facebook, it may not require the same, uh, uh, same staffing or as we do um, some of our electronic meetings already that that may not require quite the level of services. So it's two different discussions, but if we, depending on how we choose to broadcast it, it may then require the um, video department and schools or cities to do that. Could we decide that we don't want, we don't need, we don't desire to do the cable streaming service or the cable service that we only want to do like our streaming service? Would that help? I think that's, we could we could talk have that discussion about it, what it would take us to do that, and we'd have to look at that. But that's one possibility. So that, that's a, I'll throw that out there, and then I would like to get Dr. Robertson's input on how any change might uh, impact staff. I mean that we definitely have to have our staff's input for how that will impact them. Thank you. Yeah, and we did indicate to them obviously with these China changes right in the middle of budget season, we were not prepared to bring on the staff to do that. The video services agreement, the one we're working with, does require, if it's a unilateral decision, it requires a one year, 12 month period to terminate that if that's not where we're going on the otherwise we make changes. So we, we indicated to them, although we appreciated that they were in a difficult situation, it would take us a while to make the changes necessary. So we don't know how soon we could do that. Mr. Callan, you do not have to tell us if you're a streamer or a cable owner. <laughs> My lips are sealed. Okay. I would like to just go on record to say I'm very much in favor of exploring this because one of the things that I heard very early on in my journey on the board beginning January of last year was the fact that there's not enough relationship between school board members and city council members. Uh, being unable to attend the meetings you don't get a chance to appreciate the issues that they're wrestling with. And as a result, the reverse of that would be true as well. And it would afford an opportunity for us to continue to deepen relationship, not only in our political spectrums, but also one-on-ones over coffees and things of that nature, which if we understand each other's world better, it seems as though it would only lend itself to being more effective servants of the public that we're trying to be, and this would just expand on that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? So I'm very much opposed to giving up the cable services. Um, there are people who do utilize those cable services for the reasons that you said. Um, streaming services, I, I get it. The younger generation uses that, but um, I would say, you know, if they're 40 or 35 and below, possibly my better, but, but the people who are um, of my generation for sure <laughs> definitely utilize the, the cable services and the fact that the cable services 
uh, run throughout the week in a rerun. Um, occasionally, you see them on Saturday. You can watch the whole meeting on Saturday. So I, I, I want to I want to keep the cable services for whatever. And if it means switching to Thursdays or Mondays, I'm in favor of that. Whatever we decide is better for us and better for the for the uh, company that does. For VBTV. Well, plan, I do think they're two different, two different <laughs> conversations because we can continue. And right now, the city's not looking because they recognize there's a significant portion of the population that uses these type of services. So, but in the future, this there may not be the demand for it. Also, what funds this is the tax on the cable, and as fewer people are doing the cable services. The money that funds the equipment and only can fund equipment and training for this is dwindling. So it's still there, but at some point in the future, it may not be there. But the technology is also changing too. So interesting conversations that we're having. Um, and there is you, it not doing cable TV or, or doing cable TV doesn't prevent us from doing other types of services. That's something we would have to look at. We would just have to figure out who would staff it and how we would do that. Thank you, Ms. Leibis. Yes, I just wanted to piggyback on what you just said about that, Ms. Linetti. It's not that easy to just drop the cable because there's something called public educational and government access peg fees, and that money helps pay for this equipment that we're using to broadcast these meetings. So just want to let you all know it pays for all of the equipment, but not the personnel. Ms. Weeks. And Ms. Linetti, what is the guidance or what's the timeline that you need to let them know I mean it sounds like everybody's game for the you know conversation but it like Ms. Owen said like my schedule I have no flexibility on Tuesday because I scheduled it with my teaching classes for this whole year and I've also my principal has scheduled it for next year according to Tuesday I mean that's just me you know me personally and I, I guess we could, I could get a substitute every Tuesday but um so what is the timeline to give us a chance, staff a chance, but to let them know that, yeah, we're going to talk about it, but what, what, in your, when do we need to like make a decision, do you think? I think if we get back to it and say we are absolutely willing to have this conversation with you, um, I don't know when you are. I don't think it's realistic. I told her, you know, you've got clearly set your meetings already for the year because it's not only that. If you picked another day of the week, then you have to move your student discipline hearings. You might have to move your other hearings. We have to adjust, you know, when they, the, the, um, all the other meetings that everybody else in staff has to go to agenda planning. So it's a pretty big undertaking, not impossible. Um, so we'd have to have a little more conversation. When would you be ready to do that? But what I could get back to her and said, this is something we're interested in. How long can you go to for that? And what if she has to move faster than that? What is we? This is a discussion our committee would have. What do you need as far as staffing to do that? And if that's your ongoing problem, and how can we manage some of those issues? Um, so I think those are conversations. But what she wanted to know is this something she could take back to those that she has to report back to. This is something the school board's interested in talking about, and then you know we'd have to set it on the calendar and really talk about when you think you could do it. We have not taken the time to look at how many things would switch because we didn't know what date. She has suggested Thursdays at the moment just because that's not currently a date that her staff is tied up with other meetings on there. I've had some conversations with the rest of you about some of the other things that are coming up that you're starting to see that city council members are doing, which are town hall meetings and other things like that demands on staff. So you have some other conversations on what you should be looking for, the demand on staff, the meeting times, what, how that would impact other things. So there's a whole lot of conversation you can have on this. But I think if we, you, if I can go back to her and said we say to her that the school board is interested in having this conversation, we could pick a date sometime in the relative you know, next couple months to get it on the school board agenda to have further conversation with. Um, I did. I know she was looking at July one for some of her changes because some of her staff is retiring by then. I don't know that we could do it. I just no, not, we told her that that's just not realistic for us at the moment. But if we got it on the calendar, we did a little bit more research with you about how we would think would have to switch. We could probably bring that back, and you could then set a time period on when you could do that. Now, mind you, you're you know you have new school board members coming in next year too so you either get it set before then or you wait till they get in office and then figure out when they're available but there's a lot you have to do on setting your calendars and everything else so if you if you if you can tell me yes we're interested in having this conversation we'll go back to her and then start figuring out when we can get on your calendar i think the administration needs a little bit of time to calculate everything that we would have to change yes okay okay thank you just so 
as long as we have some time and then with the elections and new board members that's also an interesting conversation but just as an example our workforce development committee we're making a recommendation next school board meeting and vice mayor wilson who's on this committee is having to miss her meeting because she really wants to be here and talk about workforce development so as mr callen says i think it's a good idea to not have them on the same night so that we can work because we have several committees that we are working on together so that we can bounce back and forth thank you and that's why we got it when they brought it up to us at our last meeting last week we said you know this actually is a conversation we've had for a while now so let us get it as soon as we can to the school board see how interested they are because there's a lot of planning that would have to go into this okay miss brown all right thank you so it sounds to me like there's a few conversations surrounding this um so it's my understanding that the council meetings they're every tuesday but not for public comment every tuesday do you have any insight on that i, I believe that's correct other than certain types of issues have to have public comments to it it's a little bit harder right. than that. um so you know one of the things that was communicated to me as far back as when i was campaigning is that um apparently the school board and city council used to do alternating weeks and we had changed ours to adapt and then theirs may have changed and so um i'm fine with analyzing it and having a conversation but um i, I do feel like it's worth noting that um there may be a change there um, at a later time anyway that could put us in the same situation but um, I also I would really like to analyze um, attempting to internalize as much of this as possible um, so that we don't have to um, rely on that and that we um, don't have to coordinate as much when it comes to the staff for um, broadcasting and then um, i feel like the other conversation is around um, the uh, streaming types um, and committee meetings and i've been advocating i think uh, as far back now as october for um, streaming some of our standing committee meetings so i think that um, perhaps in this process if we could find out what a cost for that might be and what that might look like um, that would be great thank you miss lenity i thought at one point you mentioned um that the city said something about school board using their chambers to broadcast their meetings that was one suggestion it would be a little bit easier for they wouldn't have to bring their staff over here but then you would also have to coordinate around the meetings that they have there it when we talked about a little bit internally what it requires our staff to move all of our stuff over there and accessing things that wasn't super practical for our staff to be able to do that it's not impossible to do that this the communications office of the city was open to that because obviously they wouldn't have to move send people over here but for some of the stuff they're doing um it doesn't require as many people over here it's a conversation we just thought administratively it requires a lot on our staff to get everything we need over there and you, you can watch us walk in and out of meetings all the time getting stuff and updating stuff for you that we would not have that opportunity if we were over there but they do have more up-to-date facilities in some senses but their staff would be there it's convenient for them but they were not opposed to us finding a way to get them their staff over here on a different day okay all right and so with that and no closed sessions um we i'm sorry but later yes we have seven minutes okay and so with that we are um adjourned for dinner and um just just a note